Another home game against a winnable opponent and another Sacramento Kings loss. Over the course of this season, the Kings have worked themselves through a multitude of issues. Right now, Sacramento is facing a struggle of finding themselves on the wrong end of some massive runs. The Houston Rockets quite literally pushed the Kings down a spot in the standings, and we are reigniting the Kings' offense versus defense debate right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time, time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And before we dive into the Sacramento Kings and this 112-104 to loss to the Houston Rockets, I have to start by sharing a, 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 a quick couple words about Alperin Shangun. Unfortunately, in the fourth quarter of this game, while trying to defend a DeMontis Sabonis fa- uh, fast break, Shangun had a very scary fall. I caught it on camera while shooting the game for ABC 10. I'm not going to play it for you here. But viewer discretion advised, if you if you want to go to my Twitter account, at MattGeorgeSack on Twitter, I posted the video there. You can see for yourself what happened to Shane Goon, whether it was his ankle, his knee, whatever. He fell really, really hard, and it looked like his entire leg buckled. I know his ankle was rolled all the way to the floor. Just a scary, scary moment. Shane Goon had to be wheeled out of the game, taken out on a wheelchair, uh, and he looked, uh, he was down for quite a while, his teammates were, were pretty shaken up, and you could see as he was being wheeled out right in front of us, the the pain on his face and the, uh, the, the fear on his face as well, so you never like to see any injuries happen, period, regardless of if it happens to your team or your opponent, Shangun has been having a fantastic second season in the league, a really, really exciting young player that has been compared to DeMontis Sabonis and compared to Nikola Jokic. Uh, wasn't necessarily having the greatest of games, but was playing really, really solid. Certainly a reason, uh, a big reason why the, the Rockets won this game. And I know the Rockets, they're still competing to try and work themselves into the play-in. They're, they're not in the thick of the playoffs, playoff race necessarily, but this is still a, outside of wins and losses, it's a catastrophic injury to this team that's trying to build for the future and, and has a, a young man like Shane Goon who has been doing great stuff. So... I wish him the absolute best. I hope we get good news of, of just a severe ankle sprain. It's amazing that we're calling a severe ankle sprain good news, but hopefully it's not something beyond that. Um, I don't know if his season's going to be done or not. I'm certainly not going to diagnose him with anything from my perspective as a completely unqualified fan and media member, uh, but it was a very, very scary moment, and you just hate to see stuff like that happen uh, in, in the NBA and sports period. If they could ban injuries... Make it happen, basketball gods. No more injuries to anyone ever, please. Uh, you just hate to see moments like that. So I wish the absolute best to, to Shangun, and um, I hope Rocket fans get good news in the near future. Well, the good news is for Rocket fans that Houston was still able to pull this out. They sweep the season series against the Kings, 3-0. and The Kings didn't get beaten down quite as badly as they did their two games in Houston, their back-to-back games in Houston earlier on this season when De'Aaron Fox was not playing in those games, but still, the Kings got off to a solid start, built up to a 13-point lead, and then the Rockets really ramped up the physicality. Now, this game was physical start to finish, right? Like, the Rockets brought the physicality, and I thought in the first half, the Kings were doing a good job matching that physicality. The referees, to some extent, were letting them, uh, letting things go. There were missed calls on both ends. I know from the Kings' perspective, and Kings fans are probably feeling like there were more missed calls against Sacramento than there were against Houston. Uh, It's easy to feel that way after a loss. We're not going to talk about that any further than what I just said. But it was a physical game. I thought the Kings did a good job to match the physicality. But the Rockets picked it up even another notch. And Sacramento, especially in that third quarter, was just in the freaking mud. And, and a big issue with this Kings team, and I think it's been Dave Deuce Mason from the Deuce and Mo podcast and uh, from Kings TV and Kings Radio. Like, 
Deuce has been the one really keeping an eye on this and keeping track of this, and he's absolutely right. Basketball is a game of runs, right? And it, it's it's one thing to go on or be on the wrong side of a 12 to four run or a, a, a 10 to four run or, or things like that, that you see all the time in basketball games, little six to eight to maximum 10 point swings that certainly can change a game. No, no ifs, ands or buts about it. Sacramento this season has had a really serious issue, especially recently with being on the wrong side of bad runs that just spiral out of control very quickly. We've talked about this to some extent over the course of, of this season here on locked on Kings, but uh, the Rockets went on a 45-19 to 19 run from late in the second quarter when the Kings had built a 13-point lead to the start of the fourth quarter. They dominated the end of the second quarter, all of the third quarter, and brought that big advantage into the fourth quarter with them. They outscored the Kings 71-50 to 50 for the remainder of the game from the two minute and 58 second mark in the second quarter the Kings built a 54 to 41 lead a 13 point lead their largest of the game from that point the Rockets outscored them 71 to 50 in that third quarter that was absolutely atrocious for Sacramento the Kings scored just 14 points and turned the ball over eight times I believe they finished with 12 total turnovers DeMontis Sabonis had nine Of those turnovers, Sabonis had an incredible stat line, especially in the first quarter and in the first half, like got his double-double quickly into this game and looked like he was well on his way to a triple-double. As much as I want to praise the great things that Sabonis did, and he usually does in the stat column, like nine turnovers is absolutely inexcusable. And what's crazy is that's not even his highest total this season. Nine turnovers, you you can't do that. And I have no problem as the guy who always points out the the positives of Sabonis and the successes of Sabonis and wants to make sure he gets the, the props that he deserves for that. This doesn't change my opinions of Sabonis at all, but this is an inexcusable game from your starting center, and I think he would say the absolute same thing. I think the Kings know you can't have your starting center turning the ball over nine times. Again, I want to give credit to the Houston Rockets because they did a fantastic job bogging down Sacramento uh, on, on the offensive end. The Kings could not hit water if they fell out of a boat from three-point range, shot less than 20% from three-point range tonight, and the Rockets were packing the paint, playing physical, not giving Sabonis any sort of space whatsoever, smothering the Kings on the perimeter in terms of when the Kings were trying to put the ball on the ground and dribble to try and get into the lane, the Rockets were not letting up. Credit to Houston, and I I want to give them credit without that credit being an excuse or, or without that brushing under the rug, the struggles for Sacramento. Because to me... We go back to this, like like the Kings only made 14 field goals in the second half. Only 14 made shots. They shot 14 of 37, 37% from the field. Only making 14 shots in an entire half. Again, credit to the Houston Rockets. But if you are a team that is supposed to be as offensively gifted as we know this Kings team is, these stretches cannot happen. And sometimes I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here on Lockdown Kings. If you've been listening this season, you know you've heard it before. As much as the Kings are emphasizing improving on the defensive end, offensively is supposed to be their primary strength. And in these massive runs that the Kings find themselves on the wrong end of, it's not just the defense that's letting them down. It's offensively they fall off a freaking cliff. I brought this up to Mike Brown postgame. I didn't say it as aggressively as that. You're going to hear my question to Mike here in a second. I'm going to play it for you. I brought this up to Mike about, like, during these long lulls, during these stretches and, and major runs, offensively, the Kings are taking their foot off the gas. They're falling apart. They're not looking like themselves. Mike pretty much disagreed with, with some of what I had to say. Take a listen. Mike, a, a number of times this season... The Kings, your team has been on the wrong end of a, of a of a pretty significant run, and I know there's been an emphasis on the defensive side of the ball and wanting to improve defensively, of course, and that can improve. But it seems like the offense also goes through pretty significant lulls during those runs as well. Is there a balance of concern, or I guess what is the level of concern with the offensive step backs versus the the defensive ongoing work that you've been putting in this season? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I, I we're. We could score if we play like we're capable of. And since the All Star break, we're third in the NBA in offense. Or, or prior to tonight, you know, tonight we probably dropped a bunch because of the Rockets. Uh, but offensively, 
I'd take being third since the All-Star break. To me, they, then that's, eight, that's a span of eight games. You're trending in the right direction going into the playoffs. You're doing the right things, even though the last five games – We've averaged 11.6 sprays a game, which is not good. You know, if our spray numbers were up, maybe our three is our three point percentage is higher, and our offensive rating now goes from three to one since the All Star break. So, I, I I would disagree a little bit with with the offense tonight. They had something to do with it. The Rockets did, um, and I thought, like I said, I thought. It was us not spraying the ball when we caught in the paint or dribble drove into the paint. We didn't get off of it. Like we came off pick and roll sometimes and the easy push ahead pass was there because they were pulled in. You know, we gathered and had to go over the top. Hey, just advance it, let them shoot it, or let them make the hockey assist. Uh, so I thought our, our, our turnovers and our uh, inability to spray, get to a point to where we could spray the basketball and get even easier shots than what we did uh, is what hurt us offensively. And, you know, that, that's an easy fix. Pass the ball when you see two or three guys around you to the open guy. So there's a lot there that I want to respond to. First and foremost, I love listening to Mike talk. You know how much of a supporter I am of Mike Brown. I have no problem having disagreements with Mike Brown whatsoever. And look, if I want you to take that clip, maybe listen to it again, form your own opinions on it. Don't let my opinion sway how you feel about that Mike Brown clip. Okay, if you agree with me and disagree with Mike, make sure you feel that way on your own, not just because of my influence in any kind of way. And look, you should probably... More often than not, go with the experienced head coach over a a, a dumb-talking head like me who's just covering my favorite basketball team, right, and does so professionally. I think I know basketball. I think I have a, a pretty high basketball IQ. I'm not even close to on Mike Brown's level, and I acknowledge that wholeheartedly. That being said, for me watching every single second of the Sacramento Kings this season, like Mike Brown, of course, although Mike has a kind of a different perspective than me, I'm, I'm seeing an, a team that was so dominant offensively who, who carved out their identity on the offensive end get away from that too often this season. Now, Mike, in that clip, he talks about overall offense. And he, and he repeatedly brought up there that the Kings are third in, uh, offensively, or at least were third offensively, since uh, the All-Star break coming into this game. Yes, the offense has looked better at times. This is The Kings... The, the two games before this, I think in both games, scored 130 points. And they won both of those games. No surprise. Like, when the Kings are scoring, they are winning. But in games like this game against Houston, in games like the Detroit Pistons game here in Sacramento, in, in games where, like, the fourth quarter against the Phoenix Suns earlier this season when the Kings completely blew a 20-plus point lead, in those games, offensively, if Sacramento continues to play like themselves and doesn't fall off a cliff, they win those games. But more often than not, or or I should say too often, we're seeing Sacramento offensively just kind of disappear or kind of fall apart. I expect the defense to, to, to struggle. I expect the defense to not look great. I expect the Kings to lose games because of their defense, right? We knew that coming into this season, and I can point to this roster, and everybody on this roster clearly is the reason why, right? This roster is what it is. I understand Mike having an emphasis on the defensive end. And by the way, I'm glad that he acknowledged spray threes and stuff. That's been an issue recently. Spray threes is a pillar of Mike's offense. So during that clip, he brought up like a, an issue on the offensive end. Also brought up turnovers too, which, yeah, if you're turning the ball over, that is a problem with your offense. Just because you're not shooting the ball doesn't mean it has nothing to do with your offensive issues. Like I'm glad Mike brought up a couple things of things that he's not happy with on the offensive end. But to me, I understand that Mike is trying to improve this team defensively. He's been fully transparent from the get-go that defensively this Kings team needs to get better if they want to actually become a legitimate contender. That he has no interest in being a high-powered offensive team that just flames out in the playoffs and the defense picks up and they can't hang defensively. I understand that completely. But I think Mike's being a little kind of stubborn here. Especially when you have your general manager, Monty McNair, a handful of weeks ago after the trade deadline where the Kings didn't do anything, he takes the podium and he points out that the offense has not been as good, that the offense has taken a step back. If we want to look at it as a whole from last season to this season, let's do that. This season, the Kings are averaging 118.5 points per game. That's eighth in the NBA. They are allowing 118 points per game. That's 22nd in the NBA. So they're, 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 
uh, a positive to negative ratio or point differential is is 0.5. Now, also, quick note, these numbers are coming into tonight's game. So these numbers may have been positively or negatively impacted, mostly negatively, by this game tonight. So it could be even worse than what I'm saying. Last season, the Kings averaged 120.7 points per game, which was first in the league. So they've dropped from 120.7 to 118.5. It's a two-point-per-game drop-off. It's not massive, but it's significant, especially when you consider that the Kings have only, uh, last season, the Kings allowed 118.1 points per game, which was 25th. The Kings' defensive improvement in terms of points per game allowed is 0.1. They are allowing 0.1 fewer points per game this season. Now, to be fair, the Kings have improved from 25th in the league defensively to 22nd in the league defensively in terms of points per game allowed. But let's also look at uh, uh, offensive and defensive rating. The Kings' offensive rating is down from 119.4 to 117.6. That's from first in the NBA to 14th. So offensively, you've gone from literally the best offensive rating in regular season NBA history to middle of the pack. Granted, other teams and offense in general in the NBA has continued to get better. So it's not just that the Kings are are getting worse. A lot of teams have gotten better. But still, you've gone from your primary strength being the absolute best in the league offensively to now middle, middle of the pack offensive rating. And here's what's even worse. The Kings' defensive rating has gone up. Now, in this case, up is bad. Defensive rating, the higher it goes, the worse it is. Offensive rating, the higher it goes, the better. Defensive rating, you want to be low, as low as possible. Well, the defensive rating for the Kings has gone up from 116.8 to 117.2. Now, oddly enough, that's actually an improvement from 25th last season to 20th this season. So defense around the league has gotten worse. Defensive ratings around the league have gotten worse. But the Kings' defensive rating is technically worse this season than it was last season. My whole point in this is I understand Mike's emphasis on the defensive end of the ball. But the emphasis to improve defensively short term is not worth the offensive drop-off. I, I get long-term, you're trying to set the foundation for the guys that are still going to be here, and I'll get back to that in just a second. But you also have to play with the cards that you've been dealt. You have this roster right now in front of you that has guys that are more of an offensive strength than a defensive strength. Get back to, and I've said this freaking before, get back to what you do right on the offensive end. I understand you're not going to always score 120 or 130 points a night. I understand you're not always going to shoot the ball well, and the Kings have very much lived or died by the three-point shot this game. But the Kings' inconsistencies on the offensive end of the ball at times are just as crucial of a part of these major runs that they're on the wrong side of than on the defense, or than the defense is as well. Like there, I think even at times the offense is worse than the defense during these stretches. The Kings come to a screeching halt. They don't play their brand of basketball, and they don't look like themselves. And they're losing, I think, winnable games because of it. Now again, back to personnel. I think this season truly is about Mike establishing his foundation and seeing which guys are going to keep up and which guys are going to fall behind. And I truly think that two-thirds of this roster is not living up to Mike's expectations. Maybe two-thirds might be a little unfair, but a lot of this roster is not living up to Mike's expectations. Sometimes, based off of Mike's rotations, I think he's sending a clear message to the front office. Mike has made rotational decisions at times that, to me, might as well be him turning to find where Ramonti's standing in the tunnel or sitting in the crowd and just putting his arms out like, this is what you gave me. What do you want me to do? I don't have the personnel I need to play the winning basketball that we need to play. But again, your general manager is saying at the trade deadline that the offense is the problem. But every time you bring up offense with Mike, he'll bring up issues on the offensive end, but he'll be stubborn with, I believe in what we're doing defensively, and I think it's worth the offensive step back for this defensive improvement. I trust you, Mike Brown. Kings fans should trust Mike Brown. But for this season, for right now, for the immediate, a game like today, too many games so far this season, the offensive drop-off, to me, has been the difference in the Kings winning games and losing games. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by our friends at Sack Yard Community Tap House. And check this out. 
April 1st, this is not an April Fool's joke, I promise you. April 1st, 6 p.m., Sackyard Community Tap House, the first ever Locked on Kings live show. Oh, it's not a watch party. We've done a couple of watch parties where we've gathered together and watched a Kings game together. No, this is me on the stage at Sackyard outside with drinks and Kings fans and fun and two amazing special guests, Gary Gerald, legendary Kings radio announcer, and Jerry Reynolds, former Kings head coach, and then, of course, longtime radio broadcaster. Gary and Jerry will be joining me to tell stories, talk Kings, answer some of your questions. It's going to be an incredible, incredible event. There's no tickets. You don't have to pay for anything. Just show up, enjoy, grab a seat, grab some of their amazing beers on tap at Sackyard. There's uh, amazing wines and and non-alcoholic drinks for you uh, as well if you're not into that. Uh, You can also uh, get food from their food trucks, the rotation of food trucks that come through. Sackyard is a perfect place to make this dream of doing a live podcast come true. I'm so excited about it. Whenever you go to Sackyard, make sure you mention Locked on Kings to get 10% off your tab. I will see you on April 1st. Sackyard is your home of the Locked on Kings listener. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level, like the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It's perfect for city drives and for great escapes. Class exclusive Google is built in as your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of having to Hook your phone up to your infotainment system. You've got Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store on our 12.3-inch HD touchscreen built right into the vehicle. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. Also, check out the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It has room up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced available 4x4 capability. With 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure shop, NissanUSA.com. Going to spend some time here talking about De'Aaron Fox. First, though, I have a clip that I want to play for, for you. I'm very curious as to what your reaction is going to be to this clip. And again, this is a clip where I'm going to talk about it a little more afterwards. I don't want my opinions and what I'm going to say and my perspective to influence how you feel about it. That's why I'm playing it first. Generate your own kind of feelings and takeaways of of what De'Aaron says here. Some of you, in fact, I think maybe a small majority of you are going to react negatively to this comment from De'Aaron. I'll share my thoughts on it. We'll talk about it a little bit. Plus, we have to talk about De'Aaron Fox's three-point shooting a little bit as well. But here is a clip of De'Aaron Fox addressing the consistency issues and, and talking about the Kings playing up or down to the level of their competition. I mean, we, we know we have to be better. You, know, you can talk about playing down to competition, playing up to competition, whatever you want to call it. Um, we have to be a more consistent team, regardless of what that is. Um, but I guess if, if you're in the playoffs, you're going to play a good team, right? So I guess you play up to your competition. So we could be a gift and a curse, I guess. De'Aaron essentially said there something that I said very recently here on Locked on Kings, and I kind of said it tongue-in-cheek just like he did. Like, if the Kings get to the playoffs, they're guaranteed to play a good team. So that's probably good for Sacramento. Hell, coming up next, the Kings have the Bucks and the Lakers here in Sacramento. That's probably a good thing for the Kings because they play up to the level of their competition, right? He's joking. Kind of. It's like it, it's tongue in cheek, just like I said the same thing tongue in cheek and was joking, kind of. Now, I know some of you are going to react to that and go, he's making he's making light of a, a very serious issue. Like he brings up the consistency there. He says that we have to play better. We have to be better. And you might be tired of just that alone, because we've heard that far too many times from a multitude of different kings over the course of this season. And he's, of course, right. If you are reacting negatively to that comment, if you are having issue with Fox not taking the issue seriously, again, don't let me influence your decision, but listen to what I have to tell you. Because I don't know De'Aaron personally. I've covered his entire career here in Sacramento. I've been blessed enough to have conversations with him, to be able to ask him questions and interact with him, sometimes positively, as you've seen on social media, also sometimes negatively, right? So I have my opinions of the guy, but I've always been able to have conversations in a professional basketball standpoint with the guy. This is his personality, right? He is not a guy that emotionally reacts to too much. He might get 
hot on the floor at times. We love that angry fox sometimes when he play, plays with that fire and anger. He gets to that next level, and we love to see it from now uh, and then. He he has no problem jawing and going back and forth with different players that he's guarding or anybody. If you step to him, he'll step right back to you, so it's not like he's fragile in that sense at all. Like He just does not get too high or too low with stuff. He doesn't. So... I think this is Fox's, this answer here to me was Fox acknowledging the issue. I'm glad that he straight up brought up playing up or down to the level of your competition. That was not mentioned in the question, by the way. He brought that up himself. And I'm sure the, one of the reasons why he had that reaction and kind of made that joke is because he hears people like me, he sees people like you, he sees it on social media, hears it on talk shows, he hears us bring that up. So that might be him subtly kind of nod, nod, wink, wink, like I'm, I'm addressing what you're saying. I disagree with you or, or like it's a blessing and a curse type thing. Like I think that's him kind of being playful and having fun with a narrative surrounding this team. If that's not the way you want him to respond, if you want him on the podium to go, yeah, we got to stop doing this. This is bad. This is, this is, this sucks. Like we need to stop doing this. We, we got to take this more seriously. Like I, I guess, I don't know if that would make you feel better if he said that. Fox acknowledges the problem, and he certainly, I promise you, he's not okay with losing winnable games. He's also not going to go down a rabbit hole of despair and doom and gloom like myself, yourself, like a lot of us are, are, are prone to at times. We react emotionally to wins and losses, right? It, it happens. Fox is able to stay a little more even-keeled. So, Feel how you want to feel about that clip. And if you want to share your thoughts with it, do so. If you're watching on YouTube, comment section down below. Let me know. If you want to email me, mattgeorgesports at gmail.com. You can also tweet me as well. Like, if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. And I'm, I'm, I have no issue with that. But this is not, to me, a, a clip that is going to be a leadership issue for De'Aaron. I'm, I'm happy that he acknowledged it. Acknowledged the kind of playing up or down to your level of competition. What I do want to talk about with De'Aaron, though, is his three-point shooting drop-off. Tim Maxwell, Sacktown Baby Giraffe from King's Herald, pointed this out. Very, very quietly, De'Aaron has dropped to 36% from three-point range now. Gone is his near 40% or 40% shooting from earlier on in the season when he was shooting lights out, right? He's come back down to earth a little bit. That might be concerning to many of you. How, technically, it's not his best three-point shooting percentage in a season of his career. He technically shot... from three-point range his sophomore season in the league. But here's the big difference. The volume. De'Aaron shot seven, or or that season he only shot 2.9 three-point attempts per game. This season he's at 7.6. So it's still drastically better. With the volume and and 36% compared to 37% on much uh, lower volume, it's still his best three-point shooting season, in my opinion, by far. But that three-point shot is starting to come down a little bit. Now the good news is, that I don't think De'Aaron's been as reliant on that three-point shot recently, mainly the, since the All-Star break, as he was in, in like the month leading up to the All-Star break. Whether it was because he was playing banged up or the, being in the dog days of the season or whatever the circumstance was, I felt that he was a little too reliant on that three-point shot and wasn't getting downhill and getting to the rim or getting to that mid-range jumper a lot. He's gotten better at that. He's not just chucking up a bunch of threes. He had a rough shooting night tonight. He had a rough night period tonight. 18 points, 7 of 21 from the field, 9 rebounds, 1 assist, 1 block, 1 steal. Like, not a good game for De'Aaron Fox. Not a good game by his standards. Again, credit to the Rockets. But when you're looking at his three-point percentages by month, he's definitely trending the wrong direction. He shot 87%, or excuse me, whoa. He shot 37% from three point range in October, 35% in November. Should be rounded up to 36 because it's like 35.9. 43% in December. That was the month that he absolutely exploded from three point range. Then 32% in January, 32% in February, and so far in March, he's shooting 25%. So the three point shooting has come down really in 2024. Fox and the Kings would love for it to get back up to certainly where he was shooting in December, but. Overall, for a player as versatile and dangerous as De'Aaron is, on the volume that he is shooting, 36% from three-point range is not a bad thing. If he could get it to 37 or end 38 on that volume of shooting, the Kings are in excellent, excellent uh, shape. Of course, you would love, absolutely love for De'Aaron Fox to become a 40% three-point shooter on that volume. The reality is, whether the percentages are going down or not, De'Aaron is a bona fide established three-point threat now, which he has not been in his career before this. And I expect that to certainly pay dividends in the postseason, and we've seen it pay dividends for him so far this season. So I'm not freaking out too much about that. I want to talk about fans booing. 
because that's been a conversation among, or amongst King's circles, and Malik Monk has talked about it recently. I want to talk about that. Plus, maybe the biggest tragedy of the evening, other than, of course, the Shangoon injury, is what happened during the baby races. One of our own, suffering a, a, a tough loss, really an embarrassing loss. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for your role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. It's a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate in 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that a small business and small business owners are wearing a lot of hats. You don't necessarily have time or resources to go through an extensive hiring process. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Fans booing. The Kings fan base has certainly booed significantly more this season than they booed last season. Malik Monk has talked about it on a number of occasions, right? He, 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 he's talked about how he doesn't like to hear fans boo. He doesn't like being booed on his home floor. After the Spurs game, which the Kings came back and by the seat of their pants at the very end won in kind of a miracle fashion, Malik, in the arena, responded to the fans booing. And he said a swear word over the, over the before lighting the beams, said a swear word over the microphone with 18,000 people in attendance. But that's just Malik being Malik. He's, his personality is, is unbelievable. That has sparked, I guess, debate or conversation around Kings media circles and, and, and Kings on, uh, fans on social media and stuff like that. And I, I thought I'd weigh, on it, weigh in on it really quickly. Because, again, this is not the first time Malik has brought this up. Like, Malik has mentioned booing to us. The media answered questions about booing before this season and been been very consistent about he does not like it. It, It's not cool with him. That being said, he also said that it it motivates him, right? If he hears booing, he wants to, I mean, he hasn't said this directly, but based off of Malik's personality, in in some ways, it's not just that he wants to make fans happy. He also kind of wants to shut y'all up. Like, if you're booing him, he's like, screw you. I'm going to go and make you cheer for me. Which, if that's his motivation, I got no problem with that motivation whatsoever. If I'm booing you and you say, screw you, stop booing me, okay. Like, pr- make give me something to cheer about, right? It goes both ways. I see fa- some fans have a hard, like, I will n- never boo my team. Not what I'm going to do. Other fans are, hell yeah, I'm going to boo if I'm not happy with what I'm seeing. This is what I'll say. The Kings have played poorly enough on their home floor to absolutely deserve to get booed. And I don't think any fan is a worse fan whatsoever for booing their favorite team. If you are not pleased with what you're seeing, as long as you're not being violent, as long as you're not being abusive, you're not being vulgar in any kind of way, because there's certainly lines that you can cross by sitting too close to players and and opening your mouth, right? You are a paid fan. You are spending your hard-earned money. And I know that the Sacramento Kings have raised ticket prices. They've done it even again to where they've priced out some of their own season ticket members for next year. I'm aware of it, right? I'm fortunate enough that I get to go to these games for free. I'm working, so it's not like I'm just sitting there with my feet up, right? But I don't have to pay the money that a lot of these fans are paying, and I get frustrated watching the games for free, like I'm wasting my time at times. So how do the fans feel dropping 100 to $150 for a lower bowl ticket to watch the Kings embarrass themselves to the Detroit Pistons? Or the Washington Wizards? Like, or tonight, to some extent, completely falling apart, only scoring 14 points in the third quarter. You are more just allow, uh, than uh, allowed to boo. And if Malik Monk doesn't like it, that's okay. I don't expect Malik Monk to like it. Malik Monk is not going to stop it. And I don't think Meek Malik is ever going to complain about a fan booing in front of him and ask that fan to be kicked out. If you have a problem with Malik voicing his opinion on that, I also have a problem with that. Like, if you're going to boo, Malik can respond to those boos however he wants to respond. And certainly, if he's being asked about it, he's going to say something about it. If, if that influences your decision at all, if you decide you no longer want to boo because you know it bothers Malik or bothers certain players, do you, right? 
no no fan is better or worse for booing or not booing, right? Voice your opinion how you want to within the confines of not being a jerk and not being rude, not being abusive. If you boo because you're not happy with what you're seeing, you are obligated to do so. So that's all. That's basically all I wanted to say on that because I've seen some people getting some pretty heated debates about it on social media, which to me is just silly. Like, fans let fans fan and react how they want to react. And that's coming from someone who struggled with that from time to time. If you've been growing up with me, quite literally growing up with me in this industry, you'll know that at times I've told fans how to fan. That's a mistake that I've made. So Malik is not telling you how to fan. Malik is responding to not liking getting booed on his home floor by his own fans and his own supporters. I think all of us can relate to that. We don't want to be booed by our fans. <laughs> we don't want to be booed by anybody unless we're being booed on the road and we feed off that negative energy, with which Malunk, Monk also kind of does too. So well, if you want to weigh in on the debate, that's fine. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. I'm just telling you, like you, you're no better or worse in my eyes for not booing or booing. If you're frustrated and you want to voice that frustration... That's an appropriate way to do so. I never, ever, 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 ever would boo a baby race, though, right? Never. Um, but I, 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 I have questions. I love the baby races here in Sacramento, and today we, I got my first ever baby race where I had somebody to root for. My friend here in Sacramento, Alan Stiles. You might be familiar with him. You should be familiar with his radio show on Sacktown Sports 1140, Styles and Watkins. Alan had his little one, Baby Styles, raced in the baby races today. Alan has been talking this up for weeks, right? Talking this up like the 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 training regiment he's got his baby on, right? He's he's they're they're putting in everything, putting in all the work, just proclaiming that a victory is coming. He's talked it up and you know what? I believed him. I didn't put any money on the line because I'm not an idiot and I don't think that's possible or I don't think that should be legal to bet on baby races. Um, but Alan had some fun, talked this up. Alan's baby gets there, gets to the start line, and freezes. Freezes. Cracks under the lights. Now, I absolutely do not blame the baby. To me, that was a coaching issue, not a personnel issue. Alan did not have baby styles ready for the moment. Allen did not have baby styles ready for the lights. You should have been doing like bright lights training. You should have been doing noise training. You should have been putting on crowd noise cranked up at your house while getting the, uh, your baby ready for these races because as soon as the crowd started roaring, the lights got bright and, that, and Scott Freshour said go, baby styles froze and crumpled. That's on you, Allen. I also question, I question the strategic decisions by you, Coach Styles. You chose to be at the start line with baby Styles, not your wife. Now, some would say, isn't it on the wife? Isn't it on Mrs. Styles that the baby did not want to crawl to Mrs. Styles? Oh, no, no, no. It's all about motivation, right? You have to, like, getting started sometimes is the hardest part. You want to hit the ground running, get out of the gate hot. And Alan put his baby down and watched as she, as, as, as it struggled, right? Didn't know what to do. Sat there, Alan picks it up, puts it back down, says go. Nothing happens. Baby Styles still freezes. At one point, Alan even encouraged cheating. I saw it with my own eyes. Cheating. Putting Baby Styles down and Baby Styles took a step forward. Like an actual step, not a crawl, a step forward. All the ground that Baby Styles made in the baby race, I would say, came from that step, not from any crawling. And that was encouraged by Mr. Styles. Coach Styles, man, you let us all down. You let us all down. You let you let baby Styles down. And hopefully baby Styles doesn't see that tape later on in life and know that that your your, your father put you in a position and didn't prepare you for it. Because under under different different circumstances, under better circumstances, I think we all know baby Styles should have and would have won the baby races convincingly. Biggest blowout in history. It's on you, Alan. Just want you to know that. That's on you. We can hold Mike Brown accountable for his struggles with the Sacramento Kings, and we're holding Alan Styles accountable for not having Baby Styles ready to go in the baby races. It was fun to see. I, I really enjoyed it. He and his family were, are great sports. It was a lot of fun. I love the baby races. It's so much fun. Anyway, back to what really matters, if you're still here, listeners. <laughs> um, 
Uh, the Kings have a, a, a tough doubleheader coming up next, right? The Bucks on Tuesday and then the Lakers on Wednesday. So we'll see how the Kings respond to those very important games. Of course, the Lakers one is, is significant based off of the Western Conference playoff race. But tomorrow, while we're waiting for Tuesday to come, there are three games tomorrow that you should be paying attention to and have very clear rooting interest in. First off, go Cleveland Cavaliers taking on the Phoenix Suns tomorrow. We would love to see a Cavaliers victory. Go San Antonio Spurs, who nearly upset the Kings here against the Golden State Warriors tomorrow. And then go Chicago Bulls taking on the Dallas Mavericks. We need the Cavs, we need the Spurs, and we need the Bulls to come up big for the sake of the Sacramento Kings. Go three for three and make it a wonderful Monday for all of us. And of course, I hope you have a wonderful Monday watching those games or following along or taking a break from the Kings or whatever you need to get yourself hyped for Tuesday's Kings versus Bucks game. Of course, I will have a Kings-Bucks post-game show here on the Locked on Kings podcast uh, for you. Uh, if you're coming to the game, let me know. I'm at the top of section 105 in the media section. Would love to see you. Uh, reach out to me however way you want to uh, and would love to orchestrate meeting you before the game or during halftime or whatever it is. Um, I appreciate your support as usual, right? It's 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 fun to be in the midst of this home stretch and meaningful basketball here in, in mid-March and I don't know how much I feel about these matinee games. It doesn't seem like the Kings perform all too well in these matinee games, so maybe get rid of them. And I know the time change has been upsetting for a lot of us who lost an hour of sleep tonight. Maybe that affected the Kings a little bit too. But regardless, thanks for your support. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until there, then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.